Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome today. I'm here. Uh, my name is Peter Allen. I'm the director of Google University, and I'd like to introduce uh, Philippe Golden. Uh, Philippe, something. just a moment about his background, um, is a postdoctoral researcher. So Philippe Golden is a postdoctoral researcher in clinically applied affective neuroscience in the Department of Psychology at Stanford. Holds a PhD in clinical psychology from Rutgers. He also spent six years in India and Nepal studying languages, Buddhist philosophy, and debate, which means that he can prove you wrong in a nonviolent way in languages you don't even understand. <laughs> Dag. <laughs> uh, Philippe is currently doing clinical research funded by the NIH in three areas, and here I have to read because otherwise I'll say it all wrong. Neuroimaging investigations of cognitive effective mechanisms in healthy adults and individuals with various forms of psychopathology. The effect of mindfulness meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy on neural substrates of emotion and attention regulation. And the effect of child parent mindfulness meditation training. Question is, why does this matter? Uh, Philippe and his colleagues are working on understanding how meditation affects the brain. And I can think of at least four implications for this. One is that meditation is moving out of the realm of faith-based practice in, into the realm of recognized science. Two, as this research is better accepted, more people will practice and benefit from meditation. Three, you'll be able to submit the cost of your Zafu and Zabutone as medical expenses, <laughs> although not this year. And a fourth implication, if you haven't already, you should immediately go to go slash SIY and sign up for the next round of Search Inside Yourself, Google's own mindfulness-based emotional intelligence class. So without further ado, please take a deep breath, focus, and join me in welcoming Philippe Golden, whose talk today is entitled The Cognitive Neuroscience of Mindfulness Meditation. Wow. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful introduction. So <laughs> without further ado, just thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to share some ideas and open to uh, questions and suggestions. And uh, let's, let's start. So <clears throat> today I'm going to speak briefly a little bit about attention, mindfulness, and brain systems, some cutting edge research um, where there's a huge amount of interest, both from a clinical side, because I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist, and also neuroscience. I'm also trained as a neuroscientist. But how, what really, how does the brain work? How is it plastic? How is it influenced by different types of training? Um, I'm only here in front of you because there are hundreds of people who've influenced me, some of whom are here, people who've taught me brain imaging, how to sit with patients, how to uh, become a husband, how to practice meditation, and so forth. So really, I'm here, but there's hundreds of other people who really, um, through their kindness, that's why I can stand here in front of you. So in brief, I'm going to speak a little bit about mindfulness meditation, one particular type of meditation practice, and then look at a clinical application. How might one type of practice, mindfulness-based stress reduction, be used as a clinical intervention for adults suffering from social phobia or social anxiety disorder. <clears throat> there are many types of meditation practice, and that's something that's very important. The word gom in Tibetan, bhavna in Sanskrit, really refers to cultivating a certain quality of mind. So it's practices that help us cultivate a quality, and there are many ways to do that. So there's, just simply put, there are some classes of meditation practices that really have to do with harnessing attention, focusing and developing concentration. So for example, breath, body, focused uh, meditation, visualize, visualizing an image, uh, a mantra, or listening to a sound, or a certain objectless open field. These are different kinds of meditation practices that have different uh, types of results. Then there's also linguistic, analytic, linguistic, or reasoning, as exemplified by monks doing analytic debate, which uh, I did when I was in India in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, and it's really, really fun. Um, and this here could be taking a topic like the precious human rebirth, 
uh, working here at Google. Why is that such an amazing thing? The death meditation, generating loving kindness, these would all be objects of analytic thinking, linguistic uh, logic types of meditation. And then um, the gem of all, the actual medicine, or one form of medicine is uh, meditation on emptiness in Sanskrit, shunyata. Um, and this has to do with dissolving a mistaken view of how I exist, how we exist, and transforming that into a view of how one exists that is a lot more fluid and healthy. So that's another form of meditation practice. That is really, these two build up to doing this. So in the field of clinical interventions, clinical psychology, et cetera, there's a huge, huge bursting interest in applying Eastern concepts, Eastern meditation practices, acceptance, mindfulness, into Western clinical practices, interventions. So for example, one of the most popular is mindfulness-based stress reduction. I believe you had John Kabat-Zinn here uh, recently. So this is really fascinating because he took people who were basically coming out of pain clinics in uh, UMass, who the doctors were like, look, we've done surgery, we've drugged them up with lots of medications, we've done everything we can, we're tired of them, you take them. And he basically said, okay, I'll do it. And he codified and created this program, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, to help people with chronic physical and emotional pain 30 years ago. Next year will be 30 years. So he's infiltrated the medical system in a way that no one else has done to make it legitimate to bring techniques to help people deal with themselves in a way that's really concrete, fundamental, beautiful. Another derivative that's really fascinating is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, literally a hybrid of one of the best forms of psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, and mindfulness meditation, specifically as a treatment to prevent relapse into major depression. So this is to help people who've had three or more previous major, major, major depressive episodes and helping them to, to prevent relapse into the subsequent depressive episode. So this has been very, very efficacious and uh, wonderful clinical trials across um, three different studies, three different um, uh, continents. Another form is dialectic behavior therapy, which specifically incorporates mindfulness meditation as one of, one of the techniques to help people uh, primarily with borderline personality disorder, um, but has been extended to eating disorders as well. And then acceptance and commitment therapy is another kind of uh, clinical practice that is explicitly incorporating mindfulness and Buddhist ideas without talking about Buddhism at all. So these are just some examples of how it's being incorporated in clinical practices right now. What I'm going to focus on for today is mindfulness-based stress reduction as a type of um, intervention. And the first question is, what is that? So it consists of three different components. Formal meditation practice, breath-focused body scan of sensations, being able to shift attention volitionally from different sensory modalities, generating compassion, loving kindness state of mind. And then there's informal meditation practice, which is just as important as the formal sitting, which is 10, 15, 20 times per day just for even one breath. So you can even do it right now. Just shift your attention to your own breath just for one cycle, to breathing in and breathing out. So we ask people to do this anytime, anywhere, any situation, multiple times a day to build the muscle of attention, to generate the habit of checking in, dropping in. <clears throat> Oops. And then the third component is hatha yoga, physical stretching, which is also a way of getting into the body, noticing sensation. So this is the program, so to speak, that we used for uh, adults with social anxiety. <clears throat> Mindfulness has been shown over the past 30 years across no numerous clinical studies to be very effective and robust for reducing stress, pain, anxiety, and depressive symptoms overall. <clears throat> Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy has been shown to be, to be excellent as a relapse prevention, not a treatment for major depression, but a treatment to help prevent the next depressive episode. What is mindfulness? As defined by John Kabat-Zinn, paying attention in a particular way. From the psychological side, what we think about that is attention has many components. Here we're focusing on the ability to alert, place your attention on an object. The ability, when the mind becomes distracted, to reorient. 
the ability to have a specific goal and to use top-down or executive control to stay on target. All kinds of qualities that are needed to get anything done. Doing this on purpose, meaning I have an intention, a motivation, why I'm engaging in this training of my attention. Doing it in the present moment, meaning avoiding, avoiding now. So it's experiential approach. Most of our life is about avoiding, <clears throat> avoidance of things that are not pleasant. Here, this is really bringing a sense of equanimity to what's changing from moment to moment to moment without pushing away things that I don't like, pulling in things that I do like, embracing anything, everything. So it's experiential approach, not easy to do. And trying to do this non-judgmentally, meaning bringing, instead of an attitude of self-deprecation, I really suck at this, I'm not good at this, I never learn how to meditate, I can't stand my mind. Instead, bringing an idea of acceptance, curiosity, openness about what is happening in my mind, my mental experience, my brain. Here's a quick process model. <clears throat> The intention could be simply, I want to reduce my stress. I want to reduce the symptoms of anxiety. It could be that I want to increase well-being, or it could even be used as self-exploration, and possibly even enlightenment, if that's what you're interested in. So for example, you could follow the breath, and you're trying to develop attention, concentration, and open awareness, calm, flow, for example. But inevitably, the mind becomes distracted, often within seconds. In that moment, you either one can begin to ruminate, spin. I talk about people going into a soap opera mode for hours or minutes or days at a time, fantasizing, dozing. These are all forms of distraction. But then inevitably, what has to happen with awareness is to redirect, reorient attention. And to do this without self-judgment, but, but in fact doing it with kindness and curiosity. And in fact, it's when the mind is distracted and one becomes aware and brings it back, that's a key moment. That's actually where a lot of learning takes place. Mindfulness consists of, in this Japanese calligraphy, awareness, heart, mind. And I think that's telling, trying to bring those qualities together. What mindfulness is not is equally important to consider. It's not distraction, and I'll show you some data shortly. It's not suppression of emotion experience or suppressing showing one's emotion. That is not mindfulness. It's not avoidance. It's not ruminating or spinning on something positive or negative. It's not that. Whoops. And it's not cognitive reappraisal or thinking in a way to change the meaning of something that's going on. It's not a logic, thinking, language uh, process. Some of the potential mechanisms for mindfulness has to do with decentering, disidentifying from the contents of mind. So as I have thoughts, sensations, images, memories, those are events that are occurring, but they're not me. So this is decentering or disidentifying. Um, another possible mechanism is developing attentional focus, harnessing the ability to place and maintain attention. Regulation of emotion. Obviously, as one trains, as can harness your attention, things that would normally distract or evoke emotional off-balance will occur less and less frequently. Changing in how we view ourself arises inevitably, implicitly, through doing this kind of practice. And then it's also been thought that negative self-focused spinning or ruminating is decreased. So. Um, this is a study that my wife and I did a while ago, where literally, just in a sample of um, people with mixed anxiety depression, we found that compared to a weightless control, no change, we found that people with mind, who did the mindfulness course actually showed a significant reduction post-mindfulness training compared to a weightless. In negative, oh, I'm sorry, a weightless controls, people were randomized either to waiting uh, several months before they started the mindfulness class versus people who got it right away. So this is mixed. these are people with mixed anxiety depression. And what you see is that there is, from pre to post mindfulness training, a reduction. But, but more importantly, the amount of meditation that people practiced during the two and a half months predicted significantly 50% reduction in rumination. Right. Yes, <laughs> good point. So this is actually um, people with uh, the mind, for some reason, the people who were assigned to the mindfulness group uh, reported greater rumination at baseline. 
So there are, way, there, there are statistical ways of dealing with that, but that's also um, why we need multiple studies and then you average over them and then those things like that hopefully drop out. So same question, yeah, yeah. So they were more elevated in negative rumination, this sample at baseline. Um, <laughs> giving his talk. So I'm sure that everyone here at Google, almost everyone probably has to, do, to be evaluated on performance. The most fearful, feared social performance activity in, in the world is for public speaking. Fortunately, I don't have that, but a lot of people do. And not only is it fearful maybe in the moment when somebody has to present in front of peers or managers or bosses or CEOs, but people will ruminate, as we were talking over lunch, some people will actually, and my post, a postdoc who worked with me, for two weeks before a talk has to be given, negative, you know, anxiety, diarrhea, fear, sleeplessness. <laughs> so this is something that a lot of people experience. So this is the most fearful social performance thing, but there are many, many others as well. So what is social anxiety? Well, it has a huge lifetime prevalence in North America. About 12% of adults in North America will meet criteria for social phobia or social anxiety disorder. It's the third most common psychiatric condition after major depression, and alcohol substance abuse. Third most common. It has a very early age of onset. 80% of cases of social anxiety begin before the age of 18. In fact, it's the modal uh, time to, of onset is really about age 10, 11, 12. And it's often undiagnosed, untreated, or even if somebody shows up for treatment for anxiety, the clinicians usually don't ask about social anxiety. So it usually occurs early, and it usually precedes the, develop, the subsequent development of major depression, substance abuse, and other anxiety disorders. The other very important thing about social anxiety in its early age of onset is that it's associated with the highest high school dropout rate of all of the anxiety disorders, OCD, panic, generalized anxiety, agoraphobia, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really why people are interested in going younger, younger, younger. So, what is social anxiety from the, the first person experience? So we, for all of our participants, we asked them to identify four painful social situations. This client offered the following. At a job I had about six years ago, I was supposed to introduce myself to a group of five or six new employees. The president of the company was speaking first, and then I was supposed to say a few words. My anxiety grew to such a heightened level right before I had to get up to speak that I needed to leave the room and the building. I had to take a walk for about half an hour before I even got up the courage to go back into the building and to admit to my manager what I had done and how I had failed. So we actually use these scripts, autobiographical scripts, as stimuli in our brain imaging studies. Induction of a specific painful social memory. This is about as real as it gets. Then we also ask people, with respect to that situation, your own situation, what are the automatic negative self-beliefs that arise? This client offered, what's wrong with me? Why do I get so nervous? I'm going to get fired for not being able to do this. The president must think I'm an idiot and wonder why they hired me if I can't even speak to a few people. If I get up there, I'm going to blush and either throw up or pass out. So mental tripping cognitive distortions, fear of physiological arousal that I'm not going to be able to control. So one model of social anxiety, a cognitive model, says the following. When a person who has social anxiety is in a social situation, it triggers a distorted view of the self, the social self. I'm not good enough as I am. I'm going to screw up. This means the situation is, a, is appraised or evaluated as this is a dangerous place for me. This is threatening to myself. And then there's a very rapid attentional shift to self-focused attention. So much so that in studies where you have other people who say, hey, no, you're doing fine, you're doing fine, the person is so internally aware, internally driven, they don't process external information, which of course reinforces the disorder. And this leads to safety behaviors, not showing up to work, not making eye contact, not speaking up or being assertive when one needs to be, for example not going to parties, bodily or somatic and concerns and problems, diarrhea, et cetera, cognitive problems, negative thoughts, et cetera. Here I'm going to be focusing on attention 
as one way to probe the brain in people with social anxiety and how mindfulness might modify the neural bases of attention. So the big question here is integration. Can we take incredible, beautiful, elegant uh, technology that West has to offer, which is to basically go under the skull non-invasively and image the brain while it's doing what it does? And ancient wisdom traditions of methods that have been used for 3,000 years of how to work with the mind, ways to actually identify and begin to modulate mental patterns. Can we integrate this? A full description of a phenomena would really entail all of these levels of granularity. In my lab, we're looking at genetic predispositions to people who have different anxiety disorders, to who will benefit from cognitive therapy, from mindfulness, from medications. Um, how this influences molecules, neurons, neural circuits, and then cognition, emotion, behavior. This would be a full explanation. Here today, I'm just focusing on brain and cognition emotion. So we use the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which essentially is a huge magnet, beautiful machine. Here's a picture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Richard Davidson, a researcher from Madison, showing His Holiness the Dalai Lama how this works. And I'm going to give you a one slide primer on what is the dependent variable in fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. You're lying in the scanner on your back, like the woman you saw a moment ago. And then what I do is I present you with a negative belief. People think I am socially incompetent. You read that. This triggers firing in specific populations of neurons, having to do with language processing, self-reflection, that activate neural circuits, brain systems, not just specific areas, but circuitry that then says, hey, the neurons are firing. Please send more oxygenated hemoglobin, more cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow to the areas where neurons are firing. Bring more oxygen. Bring more glucose, because the neurons are consuming energy. And then we, through a lot of signal processing and statistical modeling, try to infer what are the parts of the brain that are active when a person is spinning on a negative self-belief. So it's a whole series of processes, of steps. But we can do this. What are the possible brain bases of the psychological mechanisms that mindfulness may touch? Well, attention, emotion regulation, self-view. <coughs> Wonderful work by Mary Phillips, Helen Mayberg, and lots of neuroscientists are beginning to delineate where does emotional reactivity occur in the brain and emotion regulation. So in the context of a social situation that's feared, this could actually activate very quickly fear, arousal, anxiety. So we know that roughly, this is very condensed, but roughly there's the limbic and paralimbic system in which there's a whole set of brain regions that detect what's personally salient and even generate emotional reactivity. This sends a signal, bottom-up signal, this is threatening to me, this is dangerous to me. And it actually recruits activity in regulatory systems, many of which are instantiated in prefrontal cortex, parietal, that says, please select some strategies and engage in top-down regulation to either increase or decrease the current emotional state. So we literally are doing this consciously, non-consciously in our brain all the time. And these, these regulatory practices often are mediated by the way that we view ourselves and our skillfulness or lack of skillfulness in language, how we think, how we interpret, how we view ourselves. So here's just one task, for example, that we use. We ask people, we present people with their own painful autobiographical social situations, like the one I read earlier. Then we have present one negative belief at a time and have people spin on their own negative belief about themselves in that painful situation. Then we ask them to provide a rating. And then we've trained them to implement some kind of emotion regulation strategy. Attention focusing, here that was operationalized as when a cue comes on above your negative belief, please shift your attention to the physical sensation at the tip of the nose of the breath moving in and moving out. Physical, subtle sensation, shifting attention. We also have an attention distraction condition as a control where we ask people, I put a three-digit number and say count backwards by one from a three-digit number, 168, 167, and so forth. Attention distraction. And then thirdly, cognitive reappraisal. Think in a way to reinterpret the meaning of the belief, 
to make it less toxic for yourself. Three different strategies. There are many more than this. We only looked at these three. So cutting to the chase, we found that post-mindfulness training, post-MBSR, we found that all three forms of emotion regulation, the ability to volitionally work with your psychology brain to down-regulate negative emotional reactivity. We found that the red bars are ratings of uh, su subjective ratings in the scanner of negative emotion to the negative beliefs. The blue bars are that same rating after doing self-talk or cognitive regulation, after doing attentional focus, and after doing distraction. All three methods were more efficacious after doing this two-month training in mindfulness meditation. Greater skill in being able to identify emotions and to skillfully regulate them as needed. Just to go into a little more detail, attention is a very limited resource. We all know that. It's also that attention itself is not a unitary thing, but actually has many components. So three components here. Michael Posner is the superstar person in the field of attention. He's done incredible work on all levels, looking at from genetics to training kids in attention abilities. And here, they, they, he and his uh, former student, who's a professor now, Jin Fan, they've developed a wonderful computer task that assesses three components. There are many more, but only three components of attention. Alerting, meaning the ability to sustain your vigilance on an object, to focus on an object. So you're coding. Can you keep your mind right on the object? You're meditating on the breath. Can I keep my mind right on the breath? Reorienting, when the mind becomes distracted, can I switch or shift my attention back to the object of meditation, back to the object of the work that I'm doing? Third is executive control. Selectively attending to what I want to focus on, actively inhibiting things that are task irrelevant. This is considered executive functioning or cognitive control or top-down control of attention. <coughs> These three, from alerting to reorienting to executive, literally develop in the brain over the first two decades of life progressively, such that kids really develop executive, begin to ex develop executive control in, in their teens. So there's literally a developmental trajectory of these abilities in the mind-brain. These three components are instantiated in the brain in a distributed network of brain regions, that, which is really wonderful because that means we can probe the effective attention training on the neural substrates of these components of attention. So do you find enhanced or decreased activity when people are more distracted, when they're more focused, when they've trained the muscle of attention, or at different ages, or on or off coffee, for example? Cutting to the chase here, whoop. the regions that are in these color circles are regions that we found to be, they're parts of the brain that were more active that make up parts of this attention network from pre to post mindfulness training in this case 15 adults with social anxiety. So meaning that people who, these social phobics who engaged in the mindfulness meditation training, when challenged to regulate their attention from pre to post training, they showed increased neural activity as well as behavioral indices of the ability to regulate their attention. 15 is very small, so this was the basis for getting an NIH grant, and now we're doing this with 60 people. Also randomizing people to mindfulness-based stress reduction and exercise wellness program-based stress reduction. Because exercise has been shown in some cases for people with certain kinds of anxiety disorders to be just as efficacious as some kinds of therapy. So it becomes important to delineate the group effect, exercise versus not exercise, attention training versus physical motivational training to really delineate what are the, how do brain systems change? What, how are different clinical interventions better or worse for different kinds of anxiety disorders? So this was very promising that we literally saw neural evidence along with converging behavioral evidence of attention training. To look at the amygdala, in this case the right dorsal amygdala, this is a brain region that it's very popular because when people are experiencing emotion, this is an area that becomes very active. So when spinning on the negative self-beliefs, I'm not good enough, people don't like me, we found very strong amygdala activity. But I want to show you what happens during these conditions. Spinning on my own negative belief 
shifting my attention to the breath. Healthy controls, some reactivity, some downregulation. Social phobics at baseline, a delayed, but then a rapid increase and then subsequent decrease in amygdala response during spinning on negative beliefs. So it takes some time to billow up spinning on the belief and the amygdala, the brain, this part of the brain is literally reacting to these negative beliefs. Now this is pre and post. The black is pre, the same people, pre mindfulness training, orange is post. And there are a few things that I want to point out. First, here, there's an initial burst in the people after the mindfulness training in this amygdala reactivity when spinning on beliefs. One of the things that happens when you slow down and when you become more aware of body, thoughts, emotions, is that you become more aware. That's not always pleasant, but that's not, the goal is not to remove what's unpleasant. It's to be more aware. So one way to interpret this initial burst is that people, in this case the social phobics, were actually more aware of their emotional reactivity when they were confronted with their own negative beliefs. Greater emotional awareness. But notice that then it quickly dropped. What, and this, notice that this occurred before the instruction to shift their attention to the breath. What was initially a cued, effortful process to shift attention to the breath, after two and a half months, these people shift to the left and start to implement attention regulation automatically, perhaps with awareness, perhaps not, meaning that what was an effortful practice becomes automatized. Are, are these mean, mean values over the population? Yeah, this is, um, these are across the, in this case, the 15 adults with social phobia and themselves two and a half months later in the same exact task. Do you, have, do you have any sense, you know, sorry, engineer here, no, go like, of, uh, yeah. like error bars so we can tell, um, yeah. I, I can't tell whether, you know, w whether this squiggle is just noise or whether that's actually yeah. meaningful. <clears throat> that's a good question. So the fMRI signal, um, there are many ways to do signal processing and fMRI brain reactivity, brain neural response tends to be quite noisy. So we do a lot of stuff and the only place where it was significant, uh, the only place where you see a significant drop, uh, a significance is here in the social phobics compared to themselves baseline, post MBSR, where you see this reduction. That's the only place where it's significant. Of course, it's only 15 subjects, which is why this was pilot data for 60, where you're gonna have more power. Because uh, that's, in psychology, 15 is a small sample size. Um, it may not be statistically significant, but what do you, how do you interpret the gap at the end of the, of the chart where they're trying to reverse this? Yeah, it's not significantly different, and um, uh, actually, you know, I don't have an interpretation for the end of this. In fact, these are each 12 seconds, so realistically, another way to do this, and we're trying it out, is to make this two minutes long. Because when you think about reactivity to something, you're in the hallways, you say hello to Susie, and Susie doesn't look at you, or Susie, Susie is absorbed with something and is not really attending to you. The reactivity, there's an immediate reactivity, there might be a quelling, and then there's a continuing burst as we spin or cascade on What's up with Susie? Like, why isn't she paying attention? Why, why is she dissing me? So real samples would be much longer than just 12 and 12 seconds. So we're actually exploring that now, doing um, two minute, several two-minute uh, samples, which I think is probably more ecologically valid. But, for, but we have to start somewhere. Um, also self-view. I just wanted to give just a little bit here because this is something that's really exciting, which until recently no neuroscientist would ever touch. Now there's a burst of interest in, can we not find the self? That's not the enterprise because there, no there is no central brain region of self, but there are different ways of manipulating how a person views themselves and you can see that in the brain. So here, here's one version of the self, analytic narrative view of myself. This is past, future oriented. How is Philippe yesterday? How is Philippe going to be tomorrow? It's conceptual. It's a fixed concept. And it's associated with ruminating on the self. It's a very conceptual, linguistic based view of self. In contrast, there's another version of this way of relating to the self, which is really more experiential, present moment focused, which is why this is interesting for mindfulness. Continuously changing experience of the self, not a fixed concept, a reduced overgeneralized memory, which actually means it's been related to reduction in depression and anxiety. So in terms of creativity, given that this is a very creative place, 
uh, I was reading some, uh, in preparation, I was reading some stuff on creativity. The, the extent to which a person has a fixed view of themselves and their abilities, they perform at that level. The extent to which a person has a more fluid sense of self, less caught up in a fixed conceptual notion, that person, literally in experimental studies, can make associations that are more long, more interesting. They can bring things together that normally are not very closely associated. They have less obstruction in thinking more creatively. The view of self, I think, is at the basis of that kind of intellectual creativity. And neuroscientists are just beginning. It's actually hard to publish <coughs> neuroscience of self studies, but there's an interest right now. So in, the, in terms of these two, more analytic, more experiential, more embodied sense of self. And what we find is there's, across many, many self-studies, you see there's this set of three brain regions we, uh, that come up all the time. These are midline structures. Medial prefrontal cortex, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, and posterior cingulate. These three show up all the time. In this particular study, we found it in, in controls and also social phobics which is very promising. So this is a very robust when you're doing self-focused attention. Cutting to the chase, what we found here is in the social phobics, post mindfulness training, we found significant reduction in neural, neural response from pre to post in brain regions having to do with linguistic processing, thinking to yourself about yourself, Cognitive regulation here, more this reductions in metacognitive awareness, parts of the brain that have to maintain a concept of self are reduced. And medial prefrontal, a place where self-focused attention occurs, tends to occur, also went down. Reduction in thinking, maintaining a concept of self, and self-focused attention dropped in the people who did the mindfulness class. So they had a less of this conceptual, narrative, fixed concept, and they had more of an embodied self. And this is the hot colors here are indicating greater attention, actually. So in summary, I hope what I've shown you is that for people who completed the mindfulness class, in the context of a threat stimulus, personally, idiosyncratic, negative self-beliefs, <laughs> reduction in emotional reactivity, an increase in the ability to apply different regulation strategies, be they cognitive or attention, and decreases in conceptual sense of self and use of language in the context of one's own negative self-beliefs. Meditation is associated with changes in the neural bases of attention regulation, shift from conceptual to experiential self, and I didn't show here, but we're now looking at neural synchrony across brain regions. Are they more connected, integrated in temporal analyses in people who have uh, done more and more meditation practice? Thank you for your attention. So there are many other studies that we're doing, et cetera, but I'm more interested in what you think and questions you have, maybe things from your own experience or um, what are some of the implications? Where would you push, pull, drive this kind of work? Oh, do you have a microphone? For people who are remote somewhere. Sir. Yeah, one, uh, one of your slides cited as an aspect of the more conceptual notion of self, uh, overgeneralized memory. Could yeah. you say a little more about that? Yeah, in people with, um, specifically people with depression, there tends to be what's called overgeneralized memory. So when you ask people who are in a current depressive state to think back about a situation, they tend to um, color their memory of um, past situations as, oh, I was always sad, I, things were always suck. Um, they, they actually lose, in, when in, in current depression, they lose memory for details. And they overgeneralize into kind of swaths of memory and inferences as opposed to remembering details for specific events. And that's been shown prospectively. You take me when I'm in a fine, current, happy state, depressed state, Philippe, what happened three weeks ago, six weeks ago, nine weeks ago, and you've recorded those. I overgeneralize and I lose specificity. Overgeneralized memory. 
which is problematic when you want a person to say, yeah, you were sad, or this occurred, but you, you know, there here are the details of how you responded and you were effective. People tend to forget that. Um, I'm curious how much of this works cross-culturally. Mm. And be, like, for example, in Japan, people get up and sing in front of each other where <laughs> that seems to be very common, right? Yes. Thank you so much. I did not ask him to ask that. Um, social anxiety, in particular, manifests differently. OK, so here we go. West, no, but we are a very mixed culture right here. But in the United St States, generally, it's the cowboy culture, rough, tough, strong, individualistic. People with social anxiety have very poor self-esteem. And they're very worried that, about negative evaluations by others of the self. Japan, there's another form of social anxiety where the, the fear is not about me, about other people, uh, you know, other people having a negative evalu evaluation of me. The fear is that I'm going to do something in public that will embarrass you. And it's a very clear, specific form of social anxiety that is, I'm terrified that I'm going to do something to embarrass you. That is really culturally influenced. The next question is, so you take people who are from, say, mainland China. They moved here. Then they had children. First generation, they have children. Second generation, when do you begin to see shifts in patterns of psychopathology or shifts in uh, subforms of social anxiety from landing here, first generation, second generation? Cultural influence infiltrates the view of self, language. For example, in Tibetan language, there is not a word for self, low self-esteem. There is no such word. So much so that at a meeting with the sons of Dalai Lama, people were like, yeah, one of the main things we have here is low self-esteem. We do everything to buttress up and make everyone think that we're doing fine and we don't need your help and I don't need your help. But in fact, that's, we know that's not the case. Whereas in Tibetan language, there is no such word. Also in Tibetan language, there's no word for emotion. Destructive, harmful states of mind, no word for emotion which think about Greek, you know, Greek, ancient Greek culture, ancient Indian culture, there is no word for emotion in Tibetan language. Um, just a microphone. Oh, micro oh micro in case somebody wants to hear it. Just a, um, a minor comic thought, but I, I remember at a lecture a number of years ago, uh, the speaker who was a historian from Yale said, there is no word for shallow in French, even though some people might argue that the French invented the concept. Uh, so the fact that the word doesn't exist doesn't necessarily mean that the concept doesn't exist. True. Or the problem, even without the concept. True, but um, um, there's a recent study that was done at UCLA where they, in healthy controls, they induced certain emotion, emotional states, and then what they did is they had people label the emotion. The act of labeling one's emotion, which is a cognitive method, right, uh, already distance oneself from the emotion state. Oh, I'm angry. There's an awareness, and there's a, just labeling distance oneself. So that is a form of emotion regulation, just using language in that way. So in one way, I would go the opposite. Can we actually become more skillful in identifying subtle, subtle, subtle emotional states, be it viscerally and then cognitively, and then apply a more refined vocabulary to identify those and label them. So, but it's true, with, even when we don't have a label, uh, people still experience things. But then they just don't have a, 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 there's not a consensus on a word that I would use to communicate that. Yeah. How long after the MBSR training did you measure your subjects? How long? After the MBSR training. About a week or two after completing the mindfulness program. And so that would be kind of the immediate effects of having just completed. What we're doing now is we're following people for at least a year after completing therapy. Because this raises a good point. Learning often occurs, consolidates over time. And there's even evidence that uh, you know, two, three, four months later, people will actually get it even um, after completing a course or ther even psychotherapy. Yeah. You presented the limbic system as a reactive system. But isn't it also an active system that seeds um, negative thoughts and emotions? Say again, does it? Is, isn't it also an active system that, that uh, seeds things in the, in, the, in the cognitive part of the brain? Oh, not seeds. No, yeah. So the limbic, the limbic system is a, is a distributed set of nodes. 
which has been associated with um, emotional states and specifically emotion detection. So like you watch a disgusting film clip, there's this limbic system, there are parts of it, like the anterior insula, the amygdala, that will, um, when something salient comes on, it will be more active. So emotion detection, but also when you, ask, when you do a mood induction, emotion generation. Seeing uh, will not, doesn't occur in the limbic, although the- it's seeding, not seeing. Seeding? Seeding emotions is what it's Oh, seeding, as in generating. generating. Yes, so then also there's generation of emotion. Not exactly the same set. There's a subset of regions like subgenual and cingulate and amygdala are associated with generating emotion. When you actually ask people to, there's um, studies when you ask healthy people to generate sad mood or people with current major depression to generate, to enhance the sad mood, there's some reliable areas that are associated with increasing. And those have actually become targets of direct brain stimulation studies right now with surgery, in fact. It's a little controversial, but yeah. During, uh, the functions that you mentioned are learned in childhood, like executive function, and mm -hmm. uh, are some of those better, are there some that adults can learn better than others? Are, are there some that, that the brain development gets to a point where it's harder to, to change at an adult stage as opposed to others? Yeah, so as a general principle, the older, the more that we're alive, <coughs> the longer we're alive, the, um, in general, there's less plasticity. So much so you can take a three-year-old and take out the entire left hemisphere and all the functions that were supposedly instantiated in the left hemisphere, transfer. There's a beautiful, amazing, I mean, we human animals are amazing in that functionality can shift across brain matter. So there, there are even um, examples of people who were born with only one hemisphere and only later when they were teens did they ever get an MRI that showed, oh my gosh, the hemisphere is gone. And they seem almost 100% normal. So it's beautiful plasticity. But as we get older, we become more rigid. As we become older, the cortex becomes thinner. One study, that, a cross-sectional study that was done by Sarah Lazar showed that cross-sectional, right, it's not prospective, cross-sectional, they found that people longer, people who reported being meditators for more years had less cortical thinning compared to age-matched people who um, didn't do any meditation. So that was really exciting and interesting, but it's cross-sectional, correlational, which is, you always have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, so having said that, there also is there are a huge um, interest in neural plasticity right now, but it doesn't seem to be present in uh, the entire brain, but only portions of it. So there are limits that people have to train their attention uh, that can, might be constrained by genetic, but might be constrained by life experience, but also are constrained by not having trained it. So um, I wouldn't say you can take somebody who has early stage Alzheimer's and be able to train that away, not even close. But we can harness our attention, and if you sit with somebody who's done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of practice, you can feel it. It's, it's palpable, and you can measure it, which is important too. Okay, thank you.